Hello, my beautiful babies, and welcome to Inkle Club Session One. I'm so excited to be here with you reading this graphic novel by Alejandro Jodorowsky and Jean Giraud, also known as Mobius. For this session, you should have read The Black Inkle, the first issue of this series. So awesome. Um, this graphic novel is currently being turned into a movie with Taika Waititi directing, and I'm so excited for it. And I just thought, wow, this is the perfect time to finally read this weird psychedelic French comic with everyone online. I've been wanting to read this with you guys for a long time, so I'm glad we're finally here. So exciting. Uh, fun fact, if you're a big fan of The Fifth Element, well, guess what it's inspired by? The Inkle. That's right. <laughs> so if you're a fan of The Fifth Element, you may enjoy this comic. Um, so we're going to start with a little bit of a recap. First, let me make myself a little smaller. Hold on. Give me just a second here. And we're gonna we're gonna go over some slides. It's gonna be great. All right, I'm just gonna kind of put baby in a corner over here. All right. So let's get into it. So in our first issue, the Inkle begins as a classic noir tale, following the misadventures of the cynical Class R detective John DeFool. We have a, uh, and here he is, you can see him, he's looking great. He looks like a real heroic guy. <laughs> Our main character is a real cool heroic dude. Uh, and he is hired by a beautiful Aristo from the higher levels, from the upper part of society. And she is looking for a tour guide of the red ring of their city shaft. The red ring is the party ring where there's a lot of fun times going on. You got drugs, sex, and rock and roll happening. And so she goes on this sordid escapade with him, but in, in a classic Cinderella fashion, she tells him, you know, you've got to get me out before midnight. That's the deal. You know, you need to take me down there, show me a good time, keep an eye on me, but you got to get me out before midnight. And so in keeping, and I also just, I love her halo. I love that aristocrats, the elite upper echelon of society have given into their vanity to such a degree that they have given themselves halos <laughs> just to let everyone know that they're better than everyone. It really kind of reminds me of the star-bellied sneeches from Dr. Seuss. I don't know if you've ever read that story. It's it's a real it's a real banger uh, where you have these sneeches and some of them have star bellies and they're better than everyone. And the ones without stars on their bellies are the are the lower class. And it's it's a cute tale. Anyways, moving right along, uh, she has a fun time <laughs> in the red ring. So much fun that she loses track of time. And John's like, wait, I got to get her out of here because I'm going to lose my contract. Uh, so. She is mid, uh, mid coitus with this dog headed man named Kill Wolfhead. And to kind of stop the lovers, he shoots Kill through the ear to get their attention. And uh, this enrages the manimal, as I mean, it would piss anybody off to get shot through the ear while they're uh, bone downing with a, you know, hot aristocrat lady. And, um, but the hollow mask that she was wearing wears off. Oh my gosh. And she's really not a hot young thing. The Cinderella, the Cinderella spell leaves her and she's really this old granny. And, uh, you know, Kill doesn't really understand what's exactly happened. He blames all of this on John. And uh, he is obviously really upset. And this character of Kill Wolfhead, he is a half man, half dog. He's got a, a man body and a kind of a German shepherd like head. 
And he symbolizes a man who is driven by his animal instincts. I mean, you know, you first see him fucking. I mean, he's a lusty man. <laughs> he's a lusty animal and he's angry and he's confused. And he he's like, I, I, you know, I don't care what's going on here. How I was deceived, John is to blame for this. He's very hot headed. But Defoul manages to escape Kill's wrath by escaping into some ventilation ducts. And uh, in the ducts, he runs into a dying Berg alien who is disguised as a mutant who gives him a mysterious object. The bird charges John with guarding this item, the inkle, on which the fate of the entire universe depends upon. So this is kind of a big deal. And John's like, I guess, sure, whatever. Um, and this mutant is so cute. Look at him. He's so great. And I love the juxtaposition of this red and green. Uh, those are complementary colors. And when you put them next to each other, they just really pop off the page. And it's a, it's a beautiful color combination. The colors in this, in this comic are just, it's my favorite rainbow color palette. I'm just like, give me those rainbow colors and put them all together and make it colorful and fun. And they do such a great job with that. Back uh, at his apartment, his conapt, John hides the inkle in his concrete bird depot seconds before a group of masked killers from the terrorist cell called Amok bust down his door searching for this artifact and unable to find the object they toss John. And by the way, I mean, just look at how lived in this apartment is. Mobius is just so great. I mean, I love the the detail of just the drawer open with clothes hanging out of it. And you just got all this crap everywhere. It's really well done. You really kind of see, uh, I don't know, just a very lived in apartment by a normal kind of slobby guy. Anyways, uh, the <laughs> they show up and uh, unable to find the object, they toss John over the side of a suicide alley in their city shaft and Let's just take a moment to really take in this image. It's, it's an iconic page from this comic book. It's absolutely stunning, beautiful. The one point perspective here just really draws your eye down. So dynamic. Uh, and I love the idea that in this city shaft, it's like the city that's in a hole in the ground. You have all these different rings. And there's one particular area, obviously, where you can you know, fall off and go all the way down to this vat of acid, this acid lake that's the very bottom of the city shaft. But every time somebody jumps, it triggers a wave of other suicides where other people just want to get in on it. Like they're like, yeah, I'm going to jump too. <laughs> and it's like it's so nuts. Um, but it's like that is human nature, which is just it's really bizarre. And uh, and I love this guy down here. Get me my weapon. I'm going to I want to bag me a falling one like people are, are stoked. They want to shoot suicide jumpers out of the air. Uh, it's like, what a madhouse this place is. The city shaft is totally insane. Uh, and I just wanted to take a moment, too, to, uh, you know, to show you that this image, like, it just really reminded me of the Fool card from the tarot. And obviously, John's name is John de Fool. <laughs> he's supposed to be kind of an idiot. He's supposed to be the everyman. But more than that, he's also an avatar, a symbol for the fool card in the tarot. Yodorowsky, the writer, is a tarotologist. He is he fucks with the tarot heavy. And so in the tarot, the fool card represents all possibility. I mean, the number of the fool card is zero, which is no number. So, I mean, it is the possible, it has all potential. And it is at the very, very beginning of the major arcana of the deck, the major arcana symbolizing uh, universal themes. And the fool also represents a journey, the beginning of a journey, a leap of faith that must be taken. I mean, as you can see, you have this guy, he's, uh, you know, kind of 
foolishly not paying attention, walking towards the edge of what seems to be potentially a very tall cliff. Uh, and you have this dog down here as well. He's got a white dog and this white dog symbolizes the animal instinct that can be helpful to you <laughs> and be like, hey, look out, what are you doing, man? And I feel like Depot, his concrete seagull definitely fulfills this role within the comic. He is the little, the little animal connection to uh, the natural world that helps to warn you of dangers and kind of tries to keep you on the right track. But another thing that's really interesting in the tarot, so the fool card, he's right side up. He has not fallen off the cliff yet. Um, and in this, we see John DeFool who has fallen off the cliff. He's just, <laughs> he's definitely taken the plunge, taken that leap of faith, whether he wanted to or not. And another interesting side note is that in the tarot, you can read cards right side up, or you can read them reversed. Some people choose to have reversed, um, uh, read them when they come up reversed when they're when they're doing their tarot spreads and the reverse of the fool card symbolizes an un, uh, a spiritual journey or a new journey that is unwillingly being taken somebody who maybe is stuck in a rut and they don't want to take that next step they're comfortable they're complacent they have no desire to go to the next level or to to plunge into the unknown. This is someone being forcibly taken out of their comfort zone. And I think that works really well with John's situation. Obviously he's somebody who's doesn't really want to be caught up in all of this. It's happened by accident. He doesn't want to change his ways. He doesn't want to change who he is. He's very comfortable in his shitty little pathetic life. And yet the universe has other plans for him and forces him on a spiritual journey. Um, so moving on from that. Um, so before John is able to divulge the information, because you see here they catch him right before he uh, plunges into the acid lake. And he's like, I'll talk. I'll tell you whatever, I, whatever you want before he can spill the beans on where he has hid the inkle. The police show up, these little robocops. I love these. These are like pre robocops, uh, which I absolutely, obviously I love robocops. So they send a, uh, a little mini nuke at the ship. John is the only survivor. I love this guy over here, this little detail of this little corpse, uh, what's left of one of the amok killers. They take John to down to uh, police central to interrogate him. And John tells him, tells them everything except about the Berg incident and about the Inkle. So after leaving the interrogation, he heads to the Red Ring himself and he goes to a homeo brothel for some whiskey, some SPV, a cigar, a hot bath, and a deluxe model homeo whore. And SPV is a light hallucinogen for mainstream consumption, which to me, I don't know how it's ingested. I don't believe you ever see like SPV. You hear it talked about, but you never see like how people consume it. But to me, I think of it like weed. Like weed is considered a hallucinogen on the drug spectrum. And, but it's a light, obviously it's a light one. It's not something that literally makes you see like oh, things that aren't there, but it is kind of like, yeah, I feel like it's similar to weed. <laughs> so, and I love this too. It's like, oh, you just go on down to the brothel. Just, just pick whatever you want. What kind of butt you want? What kind of lips you're looking for? I mean, I just have so many questions about how these homeo whores are assembled. What happens to them afterwards? Like, are they, are they robots? Are they like weird clones like what what's going on here we never really hear about that but it's something that i'm um very interested in also just side note detail i really love this guy down here uh in the red ring he just partied out and he's just like oh i'm just gonna hang out on this public bench and just like take a little nap it's very it reminds me of la <laughs> it's very much reminds me of scenes i see when i'm walking around town 
in my city. Moving on. Um, so after uh, having a good time and uh, he's unable to relax, actually, he, he's unable to relax, which is really interesting. He heads back home only to find a crowd invading his space, listening with rapt attention to the prophetic revelations of his bird, Depot, who can now speak and is apparently healing the sick. <laughs> Angered, John chokes the inkle out of the gall, which again, like what a lovely, beautiful, well done rendered choking the bird scene. And I love these people too, like, oh. You know, he's don't let him get the bird like he's profane, the sacred bird. Um, so this kind of starts a riot, this action, uh, and it erupts into total chaos when a group of bergs show up. They bust through a wall. Mutants show up in the other direction and a firefight ensues. The cops soon join the party. I mean, look, it's just crazy. So the cops end up showing up uh, as the Hill 210 sector of the city shaft descends into total chaos. I mean, it's just, it's getting crazy out there. John's really lit a match. John and Depot, however, escape the riot, th again, through the ventilation ducts, and only to be caught by the president's hunchbacks. <laughs> Um, to take them back to the flo floating presidential palace where the ninth presidential clonage is set to begin. And just, I just want to say too, again, I just, presidential hunchbacks, like having a, a crew of hunchbacks doing your dirty work is just so weird. And I absolutely adore it. I think it's these hunchbacks like really crack me up. I think they're fantastic. Um, but so here we are at the... Um, floating presidential palace. Like you said the clonage is set to begin. We have this brand new magnificent seven foot muscular perfect body. Then we have the body that the president is currently inhabiting, which has become, you know, obese and uh, because he doesn't take care of himself because he's always eating rich foods, doing whatever the fuck he wants, not taking care of his body. And like, why would you when you can just clone into a handsome new body every so often? And again, this is the ninth time that he's done it. So, I mean, this president too, I mean, who knows how old he is even? I mean, this is kind of like an older body. So it's like, how long has this man been in power? Uh, that's a great question. We don't know, but uh, assuming it's probably been a long time. And I really love this up here where you have him speaking uh, in the old body, but then the clonage happens and he immediately just starts speaking in the brand new body. And then the people at home are, are watching the whole thing go down. So exciting. Uh, and uh, it's just very well done. It kind of, again, it reminds me again, this is a fifth element inspired or the fifth element is highly inspired by this. And this is different, but it kind of reminds me of when Lilu is put together in that little uh, machine. It's, it's, you know, it's different, but it's, it's similar. It's, it's got a similar vibe. I like it though. Um, so now that he is, he is back, look at him. Wow, he's huge. He's taller than everybody. He's wearing a ridiculous cape. Look at these thigh highs. I mean, he is serving. Uh, he's serving here. And so he is going to now play good cop and ply John with whiskey and with cigarettes. He takes him to the orgy room. I love that the president has an orgy room and it's got just all of these pillows of light. Can you imagine all of the insane things going on in this beautiful, weird room? And while the president is trying to figure out how to get John to tell him where the ankle is, John starts glowing, which is an affront to the Aristos. Only the Aristos are allowed to glow. And he begins floating, uh, and he also, much like Depot the Bird, begins prophesizing doom uh, upon the president. And, uh, you know, that's upsetting to the Aristos. They don't want to hear that. And then he, uh, <laughs> he gets sick, and he throws up all over the president. And when he throws it up, he has been hiding the inkle within himself. He swallowed it. 
And uh, so he's got to like put it right back in real quick before he escapes the hunchbacks another time. And I another little detail that I really love about this is how, so he's been in contact with this artifact, the inkle, the, the white inkle. And I mean, in intimate contact with it, I mean, it's like been inside of him. And this is an object of spiritual power and it's a very high vibrational spiritual object. And because he's been exposed to this high vibrational object, it has risen, ar arisen, raised, yeah, it has raised his vibrations, uh, even though he's, again, just this fucking guy. He is, uh, his, his, spiritual, his spiritual vibrations are being lifted. And because of that, he can't enjoy the vices like he normally does, whether it's, you know, being able to un not being able to relax with the homeo whore, whether it's being able to smoke and he's like, oh, this is like burning my lungs. You know, like these taste weird now. These cigarettes taste weird now that he's like drinking like he normally does. But now I can't hold his liquor and he's throwing up because like his body is rejecting these things because he's becoming, you know, a higher vibrational being. So John escapes the hunchbacks. He steals the president's fancy, cool pink car <laughs> and gets out of Dodge. And he gets onto a funeral train, which is being sent from the city shaft to the Techno City. And on the train, John takes the Inkle out and asks it who it is. And the Inkle, which cannot communicate unless called upon, responds and it tells John that it is alive. He's like, I am not a computer. I am alive. And destiny has brought us together and we're going to restore justice with a capital J to the universe with a capital W. And, but before they can embark upon their sacred mission, the ankle must transform John. And uh, John is super not into it. Uh, another great thing is I love that you have to ask the ankle before it will respond to you. You have to, you know, become uh, receptive to it before it will respond to you. So um, John's like, I don't want any part of this sacred mission. I don't care about justice or saving the universe. This seems like a little bit more than I care to deal with. Inkle's like, too bad. We're not taking no for an answer and cuts him into four basic elements as seen here. Uh, which is like such a horrific scene. I'm really excited to see if this scene is included in the movie that will be coming out. Uh, I think that I would really like to see uh, our main character get cut into four pieces and by the ankle and then turn into these four elemental pieces of himself. Uh, and these four parts correspond to the four elements. Uh, you have wind, water, fire, and earth, which also correspond to the four elements of the tarot, where you've got uh, swords, cups, wands, and pentacles. And I think it's also a really nice touch the way they colored all of these guys as well. The intellectual one who represents air has wings here, and that's also the suit of swords. But he's also coming from the head, like the, the brain is seated in the head. So this one represents the intellect and which represents air and the chakras and your third eye and your throat are indigo and blue. So this guy is blue. Then you have the trunk, the upper half of the trunk over here where the heart is. And you have this amphibious guy down here and he's green and the chakra of the heart is green and this represents emotions and then down here at the crotchal region we've got this fire guy who represents wands and he is the creative the sexual creative element and also the will and uh he's an angry little guy as you can see and then uh last but not least just for the legs we have pentacles, the material life with the physical life, which is just like the body, which is only concerned with physical material needs. And you can see all of these things. Um, and also too, like the, the chakra for the 
crotch region is red as well, the root chakra. So, and you see all of them the way they act. You know, this one's like, there's gotta be a rational explanation for this. This one's trying to explain things through the intellect. This one is very emotional right here. This one is angry and he wants to take control. And this guy only cares about how he feels hungry and cold and tired. Uh, and so the uncle tells them, uh, you know, hey, I can only give life to one of you, but which one? And they all fight <laughs> the uncle. They're all, they all want to be in charge. They recombine and John comes back to himself and is like, whoa, what happened? He's back in one piece. Um, and uh, let's see here. And so he uh, understands now intuitively that he and Depot are heading towards something called the Black Ankle. So the Ankle is back inside of him. He's back in one piece. He's headed to the Techno City. He also is like, wait, there's another one. There's a black one. And that's where we're being drawn to kind of like a magnet. Now back at uh, or inside the Techno City, we finally get to the Techno City. We see the Techno Technos here. And these guys are like the science wizards of this world. Uh, these are the people that produce all of the, the technology that is used within the city shaft. They produce all of the weapons. Uh, and it's really interesting and dark that all the bodies from the city shaft, they don't get buried. They just get sent to the techno technos who take pieces of them in order to use them within their technology, like building the Robocops, the Cybocops. Um, and they're also creating some mysterious object, object called the Shadow Egg. John and Depot are playing dead on the conveyor belt until John realizes that they're headed for the dissection machine. He freaks out. Depot's like, bro, you gotta chill out. Like every time, like if, if you start freaking out, one of your lower pieces is gonna take over. And like the ankles, like just, you need to chill, John. Like you just need to go with the flow, but he can't do it. Um, even though he's been influenced to some degree by the ankle, he's not, he's not there yet. He's not spiritually enlightened enough to let go of his, his fear. And he is immediately caught by these robotic arms. A techno priest shows up. And I just absolutely love this panel. Every time I see this page, my eye is immediately drawn to this beautiful panel. And this man tells him that uh, they are gonna take him to the great shadow egg generator where the black inkle, the master of darkness is set to rule. And I just, his uh, posture is just so well done. Mobius is just the master of creating drawings that look so effortless and really communicates you know, through body language, um, the states of the emotional states of everybody. That's it's just like, it's just so well done. It's so hard. If you've never tried to draw a human body, maybe you don't realize this, but it's really hard <laughs> to draw a human body and draw it and make it look such a way where it's like, I'm really relaxed and comfortable. Like I'm in control here. And then to see John, how like un in control he is. And he's just so like stiff and like being held captive. Uh, and kind of freaking out and trying to resist this. It's just, it's so masterful. Jean Giraud is just such a master draftsman. Uh, I'm always in awe of his works. They're just really on another level. But here they are at the great shadow egg generator. Uh, this is also a very beautiful panel. I love the space. I mean, he really creates these huge spaces that are so interesting uh, and gorgeous. And especially like, I love the way that this is all colored, how this becomes more of a blue back here. And it's like more red up here. It's very well done with the atmospheric perspective through color. And also you see all these techno technos over here. Like this is a big deal. And also just these shadows. Like I love the light in the beginning, like, oh, the light down here and how it just casts all these shadows. Oh, so beautiful. And this beautiful swoop going on here. So back at the city shaft, uh, you have a man known as the Meta Baron, and he is being led across the acid lake to the lair of Amuk, the people who originally threw John down Suicide Alley, where uh, the Queen of Amuk awaits him. And also, fun fact, Kill Wolfhead works for these motherfuckers, which again goes with his whole theme, where he is a man guided by his animal instincts. So, of course, he's going to work for a chaos queen. <laughs> We've got this very chaotic group at the bottom, at the very, very bottom of the city shaft, uh, right outside the acid lake that's at the bottom. And I mean, fun fact, 
amok, the word itself means to behave uncontrollably. So uh, so you have this this woman here and I love her throne, how beautiful it is. I also love how they all wear green that matches the acid lake that they are uh, hanging out at, hanging, hanging undercover at. And, uh, and again, too, just, you know, look at all these guys. Like, you don't have to draw all these guys. You got bards over here hanging out. You got, you got people over here just chilling, like some courtiers. This guy just leaning on his pole. It's so well done. And everybody has different outfits on. Even though they're all wearing green, they all have different little fits. And it's like, you don't have... He, John Giraud didn't have to do that. He could have made them all wear the same thing, but he didn't. He did everybody with their own unique outfit. And it's like so much more work and it looks so good. And I appreciate it so much. Um, and anyways, so the queen of Amok has captured the Meta Baron's son and she is holding him hostage. She threatens to kill Soloon unless the Meta, Meta Baron captures John DeFool from the Techno City and delivers him to the queen within 20 four hours and again this is so well done where you know i'm so evil i love this cape here oh my god like i would a hundred percent do this cosplay like absolutely <laughs> this is such a great cosplay and then these people pulling the curtains back to show like this scene so loon and this bubble surrounded by these uh carnivorous sea creatures that are just so scary it's so well done so the Meta Baron really has no choice and he accepts his mission to uh, to go get John DeFool. And uh, he is able to escape the city shaft moments before the presidential palace goes to seal the city shaft because the riot that started at John's apartment is raging out of control. It has not been quelled. It is getting worse. And it is getting so bad that the presidential palace needs to just try to seal off the top. And, uh, but he gets out right before and is headed to the techno city to take care of business. Um, but another thing that I really love about this comic uh, is that Yodorowsky is using this city shaft as a metaphor for a physical metaphor for human hierarchical society humans we love hierarchies you get more than a few humans together we've just gotta have it we we do this it's a thing we say we don't like it but we but we do it so it's like we really didn't like hierarchies like we would stop doing this but like we just can't we need to have this hierarchy where you have the leader at the top and then the, you know the people at the bottom uh and the people in the middle you know you just you just have this whole system that we keep replicating so you got you got the leader which is you know his supreme highness the president in this one and then and he's in the presidential palace so this guy is so much at the top that he's not even in the city shaft he's so elite and his court is so elite that they are above literally shown as being above everyone else. But of course, if you place yourself that far above all of your people, you will eventually become out of touch with reality and you will come crashing down at some point because of that. Then you also have the Aristos who live at the higher levels of the city shaft. And then you've got, you know, your artisans and then you've got your, <laughs> you know, middle class peeps uh, down here, who just kind of your worker bees keeping things stable. And then below that, you know, you're just getting poorer and poorer and poorer as you go down the rings of the city shaft. And at the very bottom, you know, there's the acid lake, which is doesn't sound like a cool, fun fucking place. And down there you have a terrorist cell hiding out forming ready to take over you know and that's kind of how societies like fall you know they create these hierarchies and then at the bottom eventually the bottom is going to try to raise up and destroy the top uh and you see this cycle you know that keeps going it kind of reminds me of dune everything reminds me of dune where you have the fremen who are considered you know the lowest people in the empire who end up overthrowing 
the emperor who helped Paul to overthrow the emperor. So it's like this is this is a thing that we see in society. And uh, it's just really well done. It's so beautifully illustrated in this comic. Uh, it is, is fantastic. I absolutely adore it. And that is the end of the black ankle. Let me again make myself a little bit larger. Oh my goodness, look at me go. Uh, and then let me turn on my graphics here. Okay, cool, awesome, exciting. And uh, yeah, so for session two of the Inkle next week, you need to read the Luminous Inkle, which is the next issue, single issue of this graphic novel. And uh, I also want to invite all of you to join me in May's Motivation Meditation Challenge. For those of you who are watching this on YouTube, obviously you're probably not gonna, it's gonna be a little bit later, so whatever. It doesn't matter, just jump in. Jump in for the next week. For the next week, all I want you to do, if you choose to accept your mission, is to practice for five minutes every day a form of meditation. I know a lot of you guys are already into meditation, Personally, this is a great excuse for me to become more focused and meditate more often. It's something that I've tried and I just really can't get into the habit of doing it. And so this is a great uh, exercise for me and I would love to have as many of you join me as, as you wish. But there are three types of meditation that for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, uh, three types of meditation that I want to explain, break down for you, so you can try one of these, or you can try three, all three of these throughout the week. You know, let me know. But the first one is just a focused breathwork meditation where you sit or you lay down in a comfortable position with your eyes closed, and you just focus on your breath. And you breathe in for four counts, hold for four counts, breathe out for four counts, hold for four counts, and just keep doing that until your five minutes is up. That's it. It's real simple. Just breathe one, two, three, four, hold. Breathe out one, two, three, four, hold one, two, three, four, and then start the cycle over again. A, another one you can try is a visualization technique. For me, visualization techniques are a little bit easier. This is the alchemical purification meditation uh, that Mark Stavish wrote about in his book Kabbalah for Health and Wellness. And so what you're going to do for this is you're going to sit in a comfortable position with your eyes closed. You are going to visualize the sun on your right and the moon on your left above you. You're going to visualize the sun giving off all of this life energy. Uh, the, and then the moon, conversely, is going to be both absorbing and reflecting this energy that's coming off of the sun. These two things above you, their energies are going to mix and combine. Uh, you have the, the yang in the sun and the yin in the moon. And then you're going to imagine, after these two energies have mixed up and you, and you feel good about imagining them, you're going to imagine that both of these energies come down and they hit you in the top of the head. And there's gonna be a white point at the top of your head that these energies are going to come down into. And this white, brilliant light, this energy is going to come down into your body. And so you're, and what I like to do when I'm doing this is I like to, when I breathe, when I breathe in, you know, I'm like, okay, do a breathe in and then I do a breathe out. And when I breathe out, I imagine some of the light coming down. And then when I breathe in, I, it comes up a little bit. And then when I breathe out again, it kind of comes down. And so as this light fills your body, you know, while you're breathing, you imagine all of the impurities and the negative energies in your body being pushed down and purified by this light and you do that until the light gets to the bottom and then it is pushed out of you down into the earth down into the ground where it is purified in the uh, the green heart of the earth this green heart uh, this energy and then you're gonna just you're gonna think about all of the impurities that have that have you've released they are being um, recycled in the heart of the earth they're being broken down and recycled and turned into something new to fertilize new energies and then uh, once you kind of have, have let go of your negative energies into the heart of the earth 
you're going to imagine yourself just being so filled with this dynamic white light of the sun and the moon that it just begins radiating outward from you. And you are just going to sit in this feeling of purification, of happiness and stability. You're going to rest in this feeling. And then uh, when your time is up, close your meditation with a prayer of gratitude for what you've experienced and dedicate any benefits you have received to your path of becoming and to that of others. And for our third meditation practice, you can try Zazen. This is from the Eastern tradition. And I got this one from Damien Eccles' book, Angels and Archangels, A Magician's Guide. And he is a Zazen master, according to somebody else in Japan who was his master and was like, hey, you're really good at this. <laughs> so you sit on your knees, uh, on, maybe on a cushion, because you know you want to have a little cushion for your, for your knees, but you sit on your knees, you're not Indian style. And then you sit with your hands kind of like, like this, and then you have your thumbs touching. It's like an egg in your lap. And you hold your eyes open and a soft gaze kind of in front of you and, and downwards. And you just try not to move and you just sit there for five minutes and you sit up as straight and as still as you possibly can. You just let the thoughts come and go. If you find yourself getting pulled into your thoughts, just gently guide yourself back to the present moment. Don't get mad at yourself. Just be like, okay, just get off that train and get back in the present moment and just notice how you feel, what your thoughts are, uh, any physical pains that you start feeling. Just pay attention to the present moment. Pay attention to your breath and, uh, and then just do that for five minutes. <laughs> That's it that's it so uh so try one of those let me know in the comments below for those of you who want to get in on this uh fucking let me know how it works out for you personally i think that um i'm better with zazen in the morning and i'm better with the alchemical purification in the evening personally i've tried a, a lot of different different ones in different times of the day and uh yeah it's just it's a it's a practice and it's not easy and be kind to yourself and uh, have, a, have a good meditation. And also, before we end today, uh, I want to let you know that for any of you who did not pick up an Inkle box, which has the graphic novel in it, uh, and also it has an 11 by 17 poster of me in Anima cosplay, there's also a bookmark where I am John DeFool on one side and the character of Anima on the other side. It also has an inkle pin, got a little cutie pen here, a little, little deal, you can wear it on your stuff. And uh, and also it has a little, little thank you card in it. You can still get some of the inkle boxes if you are a domestic peep, uh, you can get one of those. And also in my store, if you're not a domestic peep, you can just get the uh, all the merch without the book. So those are for sale on danicaxix.bigcartel.com. Thank you so much for joining to me today. And I'm really excited to see you next week for Inkle Club Session 2. Mwah.